Opravdu nejde, doufám, že neuhoříme. Um, ti, kdo si ještě nepřipli uh, telefony do leteckého módu, tak, si to, tak prosím učiňte. A já jsem tady včera říkal, když jsem uváděl Lorenze Krause, že jsem obrovsky šťastný, že se vrátil, že to je ještě úžasnější, když, když tu mluvil na Velikonoce. A přemýšlel jsem, co mám říct dneska, to už je jako mimo vůbec mojí imaginaci. Loni, když, když tady Lorenz Kraus byl, tak jsem si dovedl představit, že budu mít tu čest uvádět jak jeho znovu, tak Richarda Dawkinse. Jenom krátce uh, uslyšíte klasický Origins Dialog, uh, zhruba kolem hodiny, potom bude dostatek času na otázky a odpovědi. A pokud zbyde čas, tak se pokusíme udělat... Uh, autogramiádu tady na pódiu. Z časových důvodů to musí být maximálně 10 až 15 minut. Teď mě prosím vás nekamenujte. Bude ještě i zítra snad příležitost po přednášce plus Lorent se uvolil, že snad můžeme na konviktu někde v příhodných podmínkách autogramiádu udělat. To je ode mě asi všechno. Už je to spoždění dost dlouhý, tak já ho nebudu natahovat. Je to úplně úžasný, já to opakuju skoro na každý projekci a zopakuju to znova. Tam to vyráží dech, jste, jste úžasný publikum a je to opravdu radost takovýhle festival dělat. Dámy a pánové, Lorenz Kraus a Richard Dawkins. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Can you just do this all day? Thank you. Uh, thanks for, for your patience and, and coming out. Um, and we, we uh, Richard and I, as you know, have had a number of dialogues over the years. And um, we wanted this one to be different. And it will be, I hope. And uh, what we plan to do is um, begin by asking each other a series of questions. I'll ask Richard about biology and he'll ask me about physics and see where that goes and see exactly how illuminating or interesting that is. And if it's sufficiently illuminating and interesting, we'll continue it for a while and then we'll move to questions from the audience and try and give you as much time as possible to ask your own questions. And um, if, you could, if you could turn the lights down now for, uh, for a minute. Um, Uh, what, there was an image that was coming up here that Richard had, and if we could just turn the lights down. You saw it while you were waiting for us, and I'll wait till the lights go down before I continue. <laughs> it seems to be a constant struggle with lights. And uh, talk amongst yourselves while you're waiting, it's no problem. <laughs> There we go. Um, so Richard, what's this all about? If this is actually Richard's... Uh, Slide, Can so. we have a bit uh, more lights down for this? <laughs> I don't know if they can do it. Can they do it more? Yeah, let's try it. Okay. Well, let's start with... Well, okay. Oh, there we go. They're coming down a little bit. Okay. I can see. Okay. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a game from the app version of my children's book, The Magic of Reality. And it's a thought experiment by Isaac Newton. Newton imagined having a cannon on a high hill, firing cannonballs. And this is a little um, animation of that, and I'm going to stop this, what he's doing now. On the top, at the, over the North Pole, as it happens, you see Newton's cannon, and I'm going to pull out this pea shooter and fire the cannonball. I didn't mean to do that, but that's okay. <laughs> that's why you're a biologist. Okay, yeah. no, anyway. <laughs> okay, now, it, Usually, um, the, the first, if, you don't, if, if the cannonball goes off at low velocity, then, that's again, I, I got it too. <laughs> if it goes off at low velocity, then it splashes into the sea. Do you get that there? If it's very high velocity, then it goes off into outer space. If you get it just right, then it goes into orbit. And I was worried about this because this was written by a software company for the book. It's an app for the magic of reality. And I thought that it wasn't doing the proper orbit. And so my first question for Lawrence is, that's clearly an ellipse, but is it really a proper ellipse? Because I thought that in an ellipse, 
one focus of the ellipse has to be the Earth. And I thought there had to be a kind of imaginary focus um, elsewhere. But does that look like a proper ellipse to you? Yeah, actually, I think they did a good job. If you, if, um, I, I, um, let me just answer that, and then I think the ellipse is kind of interesting. So n notice the ellipse is what we call precessing. So it's, it's pointing in a different direction, and that direction it's pointing is changing with time. But if you look at any instant, kind of the center of where it's, 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 it's bending around, that's going in a circle around the center of the Earth. That's the focus of the ellipse. Okay. And, and so what would happen, of course, if you did it just right, and we don't want to spend all night, otherwise we could try, <laughs> is, is if you did it just right, the, that point that it's rotating about would become the center of the Earth and it would be a circle. A circle is a very special case it's of an ellipse. A special case of an ellipse. And, and so it, it's, everyone thinks orbits yeah. are circular, but they're extremely rare in a sense because they're almost, in fact, as Isaac Newton showed, the general solution is an ellipse. It's actually interesting for the history of science because, uh, in, in fact, it probably is a, an important point to mention because the first person who showed this, in fact, empirically, was Johannes Kepler, who many of you know here. And what's amazing to me in that history is the fact that Kepler desperate was trying to figure out what the planets were doing around the sun, and he desperately wanted it to be circles. Because he believed circles were beautiful. Circles were created by God, and, 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 and uh, there was a divine pattern to, to then the universe, the solar system. And he wanted to understand the mind of God, literally. And he, and, but he was a scientist because ultimately he trusted the observations of Tycho Brahe, who, where he got that stuff. The, the Earth's eccentricity, the degree by which it isn't a circle, is 1%, only 1%. So if you look at it, it looks very much like a circle. Same for many of the other planets. But he trusted the observations so much that he finally said, you know what? It's an ellipse. It's not a circle. And, and that was a wonderful moment in the history of science because first it was scientific because he gave up his prejudice, especially a prejudice about God, this imaginary thing, and, uh, and, and said, the data tells me this. He was probably extremely disappointed. But if you think about it, if he had said it was circles, Newton would have never come up with, with his theory because his theory predicted ellipses. So it was only the fact that Kepler was honest and took the data that led Newton to develop the theory of gravity and, and ultimately change the way we thought about the universe because once he showed that a simple law could describe the motion of the planets, then that changed everything. It meant we had a way of understanding the universe uh, without any supernatural shenanigans. Well, I'm very glad to say that my little dog is called Tycho. <laughs> um, and then I'm, I'm I, very happy to say that you guys got it right. I, I, I realize what, what, what I was misled by. The, the, the focus of the ellipse is sort of moving around inside the middle of the Earth. Yeah, that's right. And I it was looks sort of thinking, I thought it ought to go somewhere um, out, way, outside. way out there like Halley's Comet. Um, but that, that's okay, good. So we're yeah, and it'd be neat if it actually showed where the focus of the ellipse is. It would go in a nice circle, but there you go. See if you can get a circle. <laughs> we can just play the game all night. It'd be kind of fun. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. Well, yeah, we could turn that off now, and you could turn the lights up for those who, for the photographers and stuff. Okay. Um, look, it, it, I th the question I wanted to ask you was sort of, in some sense, in, in a way. Oh, well, this is even better. <laughs> Why did we do that before? <laughs> this up, is great. Up, up. <laughs> Okay, let's turn it the other direction. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, As Goethe said, we need more light. <laughs> okay. Uh, as, as Kepler probably said, I'm surprised, okay? It was a great discovery for him in some sense that, that, that things were ellipses, and, and as I say, potentially a disappointment. It's amazing in the history of science how many great discoveries were probably disappointments to the people who first discovered them. I don't know if Darwin was elated or disappointed in some sense that he was getting rid of God, but aside from that question, what do you think it's hard, I hate to ask it this way, but if you look at evolutionary biology, let me ask it two parts. The first part may be, what, what in your scientific career has surprised you most? Well, first of all, Darwin said it's like committing a murder. 
Uh, and so Darwin was very conscious. It, it wasn't that he didn't want it to be true, but he was frightened what other people might say. What surprised me most? Um, I, I'll answer that as a very, very narrow answer and then broaden it out. Okay. Um, I was immensely surprised when molecular evidence showed that whales, the whole lot of whales, are most closely related to hippopotamuses. <laughs> and why is that so surprising? Um, hippopotamuses are, have always been classified as even-toed ungulates. They're cloven-hooved animals. So they're like pigs and cows and deer and antelopes and camels and sheep and goats. Um, and it's long been thought on anatomical grounds that whales might be distantly related to the whole group of cl cloven-hoofed animals. So you have all the cloven-hoofed animals like that, and then whales going off like that. Mm -hmm. What the molecular evidence now shows is that you've got the cloven-hoofed animals like this. Right in the middle of them are the hippos, mm -hmm. and, the, and the whales come off from right in the middle of the cloven-hoofed an animals. They're, they're more closely related to hippos than hippos are to pigs. Huh. Now that's an astonishing finding, and, and it, it, it's, a, it's a very small one, of course, yeah, because but it's, it's just, but it is astonishing. And what it shows, the more general thing it shows, is that natural selection is so immensely powerful that it can take uh, an ancestor which was the common ancestor of hippos and, and well, hippos and related to all the other um, cloven-hoofed animals. And because the, the ancestor of whales went into the sea, they were freed up to lose their, not only their cloven hoofs, but the very legs that the cloven hoofs are on, um, and to become totally different, unrecognizably um, different. Um, and it sort of means that if our traditional ideas of classification could be so wrong, what else may be wrong? I mean, you, you, as it were, everything goes out of the window. You, you have to say, I, I can no longer trust anything that I was ever taught about relationships of animals based on their anatomy, because the molecular evidence shows that natural selection is so powerful that it can seize an animal group, in this case, the, um, something like a hippo, grab it, take it off into the sea, and it floats free like a, like a balloon. Uh, and turns into something utterly, utterly different. So how many more major surprises like that are on the way? Well, actually, that's a nice segue into what I was going to ask next, which is a kind of an unfair question, because when people ask it to me, I always say it's an unfair question. But let me ask you. Um, in terms of evolutionary biology, more generally, that's a huge surprise to you. What do you think are the surprises? Wh where do you think the field is going that we may that there may be the greatest likelihood if you wish of being surprised or or changes in our ideas in evolutionary biology <coughs> excuse me um, if, if if i interpret that as meaning what what would i most like to sure. to learn um, i think what's what's consciousness all about and that i'm not going to say any more about that because neither i nor anybody else can answer that at the moment um, yeah, in fact, I think there's a rule, there's been tons of books written about consciousness, and there's a rule that the more books written about the subject, the less we know about it. The less we know. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the origin of life, I, um, that I, I would really, really like to know how life started. Uh, and I wouldn't exactly call that a surpri surprise, but it's something that we absolutely don't know at the moment. And do, you, want to do, know. do you think in, it's um, feasible in the lifetime of the young people in this room? They will know the answer to that question? Yes, but, uh, but because it happened so long ago, and because it happened under conditions different from what they are now, um, we could, the most we can hope for would be a model, a hypothesis, which we, we would all say, uh, as I think a fa famous physicist said, oh, how could we be so blind? It, it's so beautiful. It's got to be true, something, so something you think like there, that. I mean, I, I, let, me think, let me give you a, a thought experiment that might change that. So if you imagine there was, obviously, I think people don't, no one expects that DNA in its present form was the initial, um, and we'll talk about replicator, probably a precursor, maybe RNA, 
but probably even a precursor to that. But couldn't you imagine that biochemically you'd say this was a key molecule that, that was, a, was a precursor on the chain of, of, of leading to the present situation, and then uh, that molecule that hadn't been discovered yet, maybe in the interstellar medium or somewhere else, and then that, and then that in some sense is a prediction that it should be there somewhere and, and maybe be discovered. Yes. Uh, it, we, we know the kind of thing, it, the kind of properties it had to have. It had to be a self-replicating molecule. Yeah. It had to be something that makes copies of itself and different versions of copies of itself. It's no good if it's just got one. Um, it's yeah. got to make different versions, which DNA does. I, I'm sure you're right that it wasn't DNA. Yeah. DNA is, it has been called a high-tech replicator. It requires too much yeah. infrastructure to do, to do the job. RNA is a bit better. Probably even RNA wasn't the original one. Yeah. Um, it had to be high fidelity, which is an awkward mm -hmm. uh, thing. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, it could be that, that chemists in the lab will produce a molecule which has the necessary And then maybe properties. find it in, in the interstellar medium and look for it. I mean, that they wouldn't yes. have looked for otherwise. I guess that's, I mean, it's a hypothesis, but I can imagine you could actually make a prediction rather than a post-diction. You might not say yes. this is a plausible story, yes. but if this story is right, this molecule must it, exist. It wouldn't be a disaster if you didn't find it. Yeah. Uh, um, w in one thing that's changed in this whole field of origin of life research is that uh, meteorites are now known to contain organic molecules of the, of the right sort. You may, maybe you've heard of the famous Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s uh, where Miller uh, subjected the, the sort of chemicals which were thought to be on the primitive earth, methane, um, ammonia, hydrogen, whatever it was, and then an electric spark. Miller didn't need to do that experiment. That experiment is now completely superseded by the fact that the sort of compounds that Miller got in his flask as a result of his electric discharge, the sort of compounds Miller got are now known to be rife in meteorites that yeah. are hitting the earth all the time. And even more complex molecules. Even more, in yes. Incredibly complex organic molecules. In, uh, uh, and, and in fact, we now understand that there, there are chemical processes due to the radiation, basically, that, that from the sun that can produce incredible, in, incredibly interesting chemistry on what were otherwise thought to be inert, comets, in some sense. There can be incredibly complex chemistry. Plus, we should add that Miller's experiment was, wrong, was unnecessary for another reason. They had the wrong atmosphere. Yes. We thought the atmosphere was methane and everything else, but yes. the atmosphere of the early Earth was mostly carbon dioxide, yes. like Mars now. Yeah. So the, the problem of the origin of life has got a bit easier because the, 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 some of the raw materials are now uh, known to be there. Um, but maybe, it's, maybe I should ask you a question. Sure. Yeah, no. I was going to say it's a um, good time to do that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think um, one of the things that I worry about about physics is that it's so utterly counterintuitive, so totally weird. Um, <laughs> and I'm kind of reconciled to this. I kind of reconciled to the fact that my brain, and indeed everybody else's brain, uh, ha is a product of Darwinian natural selection uh, designed to understand how to catch prey, how to find water holes, how to make tools, how to avoid being eaten by lions. Um, in other words, how to survive in a world of medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds. So our brains were never equipped to deal with things that move near the speed of light, and were never equipped to deal with very, very small things like quanta. A am I popping? Is that, is, is that okay? Um, so in a way, that's one way of, of saying why physics appears so weird. But I want to ask a, a physicist when, when you have to deal with these weird things like quantum entanglement and the two-slit experiment and things, do you just say, oh, well, I don't even try to understand it, or I, I just get the mathematics right? And, and the predictions that follow from the mathematics are then tested by experimentalists and they, and they work. Or do you get frustrated? Do you sort of bang your head against the wall because I, you can't actually um, get, uh, understand in your head what it means to say that a particle's in two places at once, or whatever it might be? Well, you know, I think it's a combination in both. Um, physics is weird and then really weird. And um, because relativity is weird, 
but you can get your head around it. You can, it's, it, you, can, you can intuitively imagine, as Einstein did, in fact, imagine what it'd be like to be sitting on a light wave. That's what we led him. All of, the, all of the Gedanken experiments that he did were ones where you could imagine and have a physical picture. Ultimately, why light bends in a, in a, in a gravitational field is, is a really simple, it's an experiment anyone can do to understand that. It's just, uh, I don't know if it, should I take the time to do that? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, anyone can do the experiment he did once you, in your head once you think about it, which is to be in an elevator in empty space. Okay. And the elevator is just sitting there, and there's, there's two holes in the side of the elevator, and a laser beam goes straight across in a, in, a, in a straight line. Now, what Einstein realized, which led him to general relativity, is that if the elevator is suddenly accelerating upward, as all of you have experienced, you feel a force pushing you down to the floor. You feel as if you're being pulled down to the floor. And he realized there's no way to distinguish that from gravity. There's no way to distinguish whether you're accelerating upward in empty space or whether you're in a gravitational field. So that led him to general relativity. But the neat thing is he realized immediately that meant light must bend. Because if you're an elevator that's accelerating upward, like this, the light goes in a straight line, but the floor is approaching the light. So if you're in the elevator, it looks like the light is getting closer to the floor. If you're in the frame of the elevator, because the light starts here, but by the time reaches, the light reaches the other end, the elevator has moved up. So in the elevator, it looks like the light is bending. Therefore, he said, if acceleration is like gravity, light must bend. And that, that kind of, it's crazy, and we don't see it, but it's the kind of intuition that you could build up, and Einstein did. But that, would be, true, that would be true of sound waves as well, wouldn't it? I mean, what's special well, about light? Well, ex what, that, that was his point. Light is no different than matter. Before, people didn't realize that light, if you wish, is affected by gravity because light doesn't have any mass. And before, everyone said, yeah, all objects fall towards the Earth. But people didn't think light did. Light always travels in a straight line, classically. But when you had general relativity, you unified light and matter. Energy and matter became unified, and the source of gravity was not matter any longer, but energy. And all forms of energy are affected by gravity. And so light falls just like that cannonball, except Actually, what Einstein eventually showed is it falls twice as fast because the space is actually curved. But that's, that's the weird mathematics that you can never <laughs> picture in your head. But the idea that light bends is at least intuitively obvious. The, to get the factor of two is incredibly intuitively non-obvious, and Einstein got it wrong for about four years. In fact, it's an accident of history that makes it so interesting. His, the, thank goodness for the World War I. It was the greatest thing that happened to physics. A lot of people died, but not, and not for a good cause, I wouldn't say that. But Einstein actually predicted in his theory how much light should bend in his original theory in 1912, 1913. And they were going to go out and measure the bending of light by looking at a solar eclipse and seeing how the light would bend from a star that was otherwise behind the sun that you couldn't see. And if it bent around the sun, you'd be able to see the star. But you could only see the star during an eclipse because otherwise the sun blocks it out. And so he made that prediction, but World War I happened, and they couldn't do the prediction. They couldn't test it. In the meantime, he got the thing right by 1916, and after the war, a British expedition, led by Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, to South America, made the measurement, and that's what made Einstein famous. Because not only did he get it right, was a new theory of gravity, but I kind of think it was the poetry of a British expedition testing the idea of a German scientist Two nations that have been at war were now suddenly working together to do science. So I think the poetry of that was part of the reason that Einstein became famous. Somebody mm -hmm. asked Einstein, what would you have said if Eddington had uh, not found yeah. it that light bent? And Einstein said, then I would have felt sorry for the dear Lord. The theory is correct. <laughs> yes, but it was, one, it was another example where he used the, the, the name of God in vain because he didn't really mean the dear Lord. People seem to think because of those things that Einstein was religious. He certainly, not in a traditional sense. He, he, he described traditional religion as a fairy tale. But, but anyway, to get back to your question, th that part of general relativity, I just gave you the, the baby version, the general lesson. It's intuitive. Light bends. But when it comes to quantum mechanics, there's no intuition. There's no understanding. There's nothing you can do to ever picture it. 
in a, in a way. You can, uh, nothing makes sense. There's no picture that you can ever come up with as a classical individual that allows quantum mechanics to make sense. And that is frustrating. And it means that you, you can never trust your intuition. But I think it's always true. As a, I think we learn as a scientist, we, we base our ideas on intuition. So that leads us in a certain direction, but we can never trust it. There's a temptation to say, oh, uh, quantum theory is incredibly um, unintuitive and difficult to understand. Oriental mysticism is in incredibly difficult. Therefore, they've got something to do with each other, and the, the, which is, of course, nonsense. I mean, the, and the reason, the, the difference is that the predictions of quantum theory, however difficult the theory is to understand, the predictions are just prodigiously accurate. Uh, and, and so, I mean, to the, to, to the umpteenth significant figure. In fact, yeah, and well, in, in ways that Einstein probably never liked and should have realized were right. Every time you try and test quantum mechanics, then the incredibly non-intuitive aspects of quantum mechanics, the things that make it physically impossible, the fact that particles can be in two places at once, the fact that particles actually are doing many things at the same time until you measure them, all those things can be, can be tested. And, and, and I think the, you know, there's an interesting, I, w I was just writing about this. Um, it was a really good quantum physicist named Hanbury Brown. Um, and he, he, um, he wrote that in some sense, the quantum mechanics is like the Athenian creed, okay? Which is, you know, the, the, which I think is the nonsense from the church that says the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, they're all together and they're all, they're both the Father and the Son and the Holy, and he said, well, quantum mechanics kind of like that because, <laughs> because, you know, an electron has, is, is many things at the same time. And in some sense, you kind of have to have faith in one. And he said it was, like, it was like having faith in the other. But the difference is, there's a big difference. One was we're driven to by experiment. The other is just semantics. And it doesn't predict anything. It's just a way of making, of trying to make some nonsense seem sensible. Whereas, in fact, the, the quantum mechanics says it's nonsense, but it's true. You don't have to think it's reasonable. There's no logic, there's no classical logic that can ever, ever be consistent with a particle doing many things at once before you measure it. And you always measure it doing one thing once you've measured it. But when you don't measure it, it's doing everything. There's no way of understanding that. And in fact, there's a nice film we both watched here to make a connection to, um, uh, by a, a Dan Danish uh, filmmaker. Uh, what was it called? Do you remember? Something about, what's it called? Does anyone, Jakob, are you? Anyway, it's something, it's a film that was screened here about quantum mechanics. And, um, and they talk about quantum computers and how we're going to try and use this, the weirdness of quantum mechanics to change our lives. We already, by the way, do use the weirdness of quantum mechanics. My, my iPhone and all, everything in this room wouldn't work if it weren't for the weirdness of quantum mechanics. That, that's for sure. But we can mac make macroscopic these weird, weird aspects to build new types of computers but the first person to, to kind of think about this was Richard Feynman, the physicist. And he said he wanted to make a quantum, he didn't call it a quantum computer, but he said it would be great if we had a computer that we could build that used these principles of quantum mechanics, because maybe then he'd understand it. And he was one of the developers of the modern theory of quantum mechanics in a way. And he basically said, I don't understand it. Maybe if we had a computer doing these things macroscopically, I could get better into sort of an intuitive picture of what's happening. But no one ever can. And every time we try and come up with a, what's called an interpretation of quantum mechanics, it makes what Einstein said, that spooky action at a distance. Every time you try and make sense of quantum mechanics, you make a picture that you're used to because we evolved on the, on the plane to avoid lions. And that picture always makes no sense. And so some people really get bothered by that. But they should realize it's just an interpretation. It's a classical interpretation, but the world isn't classical. It's quantum mechanical, so there's no reason that the classical interpretation, which is what we all would like, would make sense. There's no need for it to make sense because the world isn't classical. Just get over it. I wonder and whether I, it would partly help if we stopped thinking of very small particles as though they were little balls, um, which we have to do anyway because you know this, this, this table is empty space. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the reason why my fist can't go through it is because it's because of fields, isn't it? Um, yeah, and the electric fields. The electric fields. And our brains have been, and our eyes, our, our sensory systems have been 
naturally selected to, to see that and feel it as a solid object. And we can handle solid objects. We, we understand solid objects. And so we want physics to be all about little balls bumping into each other. And, and to some extent, we can get away with that. But at times, we can't. And we probably should stop thinking of very small particles as being particles at all. Well, sometimes, the, unfortunately, we can't. Because sometimes they behave perfectly well like particles. It's just that sometimes they don't. It's not as if they're never particles. Sometimes they really are particles. But sometimes they're not. And, and that's the problem. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, I think that's one of the great parts of science. I want to ask you the same question in the sense of biology. Is that is the fact that, I mean, one of the great things about science is it forces us to get out of our own myopic picture of reality, to realize that what we want to be true, like Kepler, isn't necessarily true, whether we like it or not. We may not like the way the universe works, but the universe doesn't give a damn. And, and, and if, I, it's, if I think, yeah, physics is, in some sense, unfathomable from a, it seems weird, sometimes, when I look at a cell, when I see, when I, let me ask you if you feel this way, or maybe you, you don't, is a cell, and part of the reason people have such a problem with evolution, if you actually look at all the amazing chemistry that's going on in your body and every cell, it really does seem to me to be unbelievably complicated. And it's so hard to imagine that it just happened. Yeah. Well, it didn't just happen. I mean, that, that, that's very important to understand. Um, by the way, um, the th thing about, something you said just now reminded me of a lovely quote. Of a, a, a lady said, I accept the universe. And somebody said, by gad, she'd better. <laughs> the universe doesn't give a damn about it. It, it doesn't exactly. Okay. And uh, whether you, if um, you don't like it, just go uh, It's not just cells, of course, that are uh, unimaginably complicated. I mean, the bodies are too, and bodies are just made of billions of cells. Um, I guess what I'm asking is sort of, we, I mean, you explained so beautifully for the world in the selfish gene, it, 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 the, and maybe we'll get to genes in a second, but, but the, the illusion of design, which Darwin was, was spent so much time talking about, but the illusion of design is so, un, I find it more powerful in biology maybe than I do in physics. Some people seem to think that, you know, the fact that we're here, it, it, suggest design, but of course they're wrong. But, but, but to me, in, it, it's, in biology, it seems so much more yeah. powerful. Uh, well, William Paley himself said exactly the same thing. He said, he said the, something like the works of the creator are far more strongly manifested in, in biology than in science, because it, because in, in, than, in, than in physics, um, because things in physics are, are mostly simple with the possible exception. He made the exception of the rings of Saturn was the only thing you'll think of. <laughs> um, but, but yes, I mean, bi biology is frighteningly, hideously complicated, uh, and which of course is why we're, we're here at all. It's why we're capable of thinking about it. We wouldn't be, um, and, and anybody who's capable of thinking about how complicated it is has got to be complicated. Mm. Uh, so, so it sort of obviously has to be because we're here. Um, the, the complexity of a single cell is utterly bewildering. And the more we learn, in some sense, the more amazing it is, right? I mean, yes. Um, the, the one way to look at that is just, well, what the, 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 the first thing to say is that it doesn't just happen. Yeah. Uh, natural selection is very far from just happening. Natural selection, evolution by natural selection, is a slow, gradual, incremental pr process. So it's sort of misleading to, to think that it just sort of tumbled into, into position. Um, it's uh, complicated things like us are put together by embryonic processes, process of embryology. And the process of embryology can be sort of tamed, the complexity of it can be sort of tamed if you realize that everything goes on in lit by little local rules all over the body. So it's not that there's some kind of great big blueprint which builds the whole body in the way that an architect would, would build, a, build a house or a, an engineer would build a, a plane. Um, it's rather that uh, in, at, at every, every level, within the cell, between cells, little local rules are being, are being obeyed. A model for that might be the behavior of worker ants or termites building a, building a, 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 building a nest. Um, a termite mound is quite a complicated skyscraper of mud, and it's got a complicated internal structure. It's got a kind of air conditioning system, 
chimneys and tunnels and things. Uh, no one worker termite has the faintest idea what it's doing. All, all they're doing is following little tiny rules. If you see a blob of mud of a certain shape, put another blob on top. So the, the, the rules are little miniature local rules that are going on all over the, the termite mound. And uh, the result of all these little local rules is that the whole mound emerges, the whole mound appears. And that's a model for the embryo. But, you know, I wonder, is that, that may be why the difficulty in biology, I mean, in physics, what we've done, we've been much more successful, I think, than biology in finding those local rules. So in physics, and we, people call it reductionism, but I'm, my background is as a particle physicist, but at some point we'd say, look, there's this complicated universe, but there really are simple, basic local rules. And a, a physical example of what you just gave might be, say, a snowflake, which is incredibly beautiful, but at the same time, it's based on local rules for, for a polar molecule, H2O, with 57 degree uh, angles that can form a crystal, and locally, each each molecule knows, only knows about the neighboring molecule, exactly. and you produce this beautiful structure. Yeah, exactly. But the neat thing is, in physics, we can actually dis more or less explain how that happens from first principles. We're probably not there yet. No, that's not. But it's the, I mean, it, a, a, a developing embryo is like a, is like a, a gigantic snowflake. Yeah. I mean, it's just lots of lots of little growing rules of that of that type. Um, you you. The, the way the DNA contr controls it is by controlling the production of enzymes, mm -hmm. uh, of pr protein molecules, which then coil into s particular shapes, following the laws of chemistry, uh, so that the, the one-dimensional string of coded information in DNA is transcribed in a way that we fully understand now into a one-dimensional string of amino acids, which is, a, which is what a protein chain is. And then the one-dimensional string of amino acids following the laws of chemistry, coils up into a, into a knot, into a shape. And that, that follows deterministic rules. Yeah. And then that three-dimensional shape determines the catalytic properties of that enzyme. So indirectly, the DNA is controlling the catalytic properties of the enzyme. At no point does, does the DNA or the protein or anybody else know what it's doing. It's just that with hindsight, natural selection favors those proteins which do the right thing. We're doing the right thing is catalyzing the right chemical reaction. And catalyzing the right chemical reaction is the right thing because it has an effect upon cellular metabolism. And that does the right thing because it has an effect on interaction with neighboring cells, just like the little termites. Uh, and the interaction between neighboring cells has the right effect because the cells move around and twist and turn and form membranes form layers which fold in, invaginate, and all this is happening in a, uh, a sort of mechanical way following local rules until the embryo itself emerges. Mm -hmm. There's no blueprint, there's no plan. It's just that natural selection over many generations favors every little titivating detail of the, uh, of the, of the cellular chemistry, which, which has the effect ultimately of producing this, this prodigiously complicated embryo, which then grows into a, a thinking adult. But I, th I, and I, don't, I think I know the answer to this, but, but the, that's a picture which certainly works, and we can see it by seeing, we, we know the functionality of proteins depends upon their, but at this point, it's probably still too complex numerically to predict in advance the, the yeah. three-dimensional structure. Uh, it is, definitely. Yeah, and that's where we're sort of not yet yeah, there. But we probably definitely. will be with, with the new... Comp well, with, as, maybe. I mean, with, that's, with quantum computers. That, that, that's a good possibility. I mean, the, the best model system at the moment is the tiny nematode worm, Cena rhabditis elegans. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little tiny worm. I mean, just, just, just above microscopic. You can sort of see it. Uh, and th this worm has now been... Lots and lots of groups all over the world working on, the, on, on this worm. Um, Unlike us, where although we, we sort of are, are, are roughly the same, it's not possible to say cell number 156. In the Cenorhabditis worm, it is. Mm -hmm. There's a finite number of, of cells. Uh, the exact position and location of each one of these named cells is known. Um, the embryonic origin of each one of these named cells is known. You can actually plot a family tree of each one of the cells of, the, of this little worm. And you can say, yes, Th this cell there is a second cousin of that cell there. 
and their common ancestor was that one there. Um, and um, so the, the entire cellular history of the development of the worm is, is, is known. Um, the entire wiring diagram of the nervous system is known uh, by act literally doing slice, serial section slices right through the worm and then giving the slices to the um, computer and letting it reconstruct the three-dimensional picture. So um, there are mutant worms which, which can be detected by looking for, for example, oddities of behavior. You look at uh, a great writhing field of these little tiny worms mm -hmm. and you pick out, they're all writhing around and then one of them is doing it in a different way, corkscrewing around. You pick it out, clone it, so you've got a new field entirely made of these little corkscrewing worms. Mm -hmm. And then you look at what's different about it. So you find this particular um, genetic lesion in the nervous system is what causes this corkscrewing be be behavior. Um, the embryology of that then can, can be studied. And the exact moment in the, in the embryology, this descent tree of cells, um, you know exactly at what point the change happened in the embryology of the worm. So uh, th this, is, this worm has only a few hundred cells, whereas we have trillions of cells. I think that's the point. I mean, mm. when we try, ultimately, that's the challenge. And I have people often say, I think I'm joking when I say that's why I do physics, because it's easy. <laughs> I mean, biology is just a lot more complicated. It's just it, it's a, a complex systems, and it's going to take a long time if we really want to get to the reduction, to take biology to where physics is now. It, and I don't know if it'll ever happen, but maybe if we have the computing resources where you can say, let me start and just predict completely the, the structure and the, and, the, and, the, and the functionality of a complex system from some yes. putting a bunch of atoms I in. I think there might come a point where you don't really even want to try because uh, it would be a little bit like saying when, you, when you, you're using a computer and you're using it to do word processing or spreadsheets or, or Mathematica or whatever it is you're using it for playing chess, um, we, we all know that there's nothing but noughts and ones mm -hmm. shuttling around, changing from, from one to the now, other. Now, they'll we'll change when we have quantum computers, but go on. Yeah, okay, for <laughs> now, we're, we're, they're noughts and ones in lots and lots of little integrated circuits. But you'd be completely insane to try to express what's going on when somebody plays chess, with, when a computer is playing chess. You don't want to talk about noughts and ones. You talk about higher order yeah. uh, subroutines. Um, yeah, but maybe we'll want to know why, why we love people. <laughs> y yes, but, but again, we do it in, with, with, with higher order, order subroutines. You're right. It's I mean, not, I mean, a if chess you want to talk about program. oatmeal, it's no sense. How oatmeal, but you're right. In yeah. physics, if you want, we, oatmeal is very complicated, but we don't talk about it by saying the protons and neutrons are. No. Just, yeah, we yeah. talk. Let, by the way, I, I have to throw this in. I didn't know Paley talked about the rings of Saturn as maybe the one. Yeah. But actually, this is, I just learned this. You might be fascinated. You may be fascinated. I'm fascinated, so that's why I'm going to talk about it. But. Um, the rings of Saturn may help ex us point out that, that, in fact, life wasn't designed, believe it or not, biological life. One of the neatest discoveries that was just made a few, about a month ago. So um, there's a moon of, of Jupiter called Encelad of, of Saturn called Enceladus. It's a beautiful ice ball, but it's not just ice, it's got cracks in it. It has geysers, ice geysers. It's shooting material out. And in fact, it's shooting out hydrocarbons. Okay, and so we realize that there's probably an ocean underneath and maybe it's a great place to find life. Well, it turns out by looking at the rings of Saturn, we now realize it may be the best place in the solar system to find life other than Earth and find it maybe a second evolutionary generation of well, life. Enceladus or, 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 um, en or Enceladus. the rings, the rings en of Saturn. Okay. And it's because of a little bit of physics. It turns out the physics, we now know that one of the outer rings of Saturn is caught, produced completely by the particles that are emitted by Enceladus. Okay. They mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And what's really neat is we can look at those particles, they're silicates, and the size of the silicate comes from the conditions of the deep water that produce the geyser. The hotter the water, the acidity, different level of the acidity of the water will produce different, different silicates, different little grains. And by measuring the grains on the outer ring of Jupiter, which we've been able to do with the Cassini satellite, we've been able to find Saturn. out that the water inside Enceladus is warm enough to be about 80 degrees Celsius and actually have a, 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 an acidity which isn't that different from the Earth's oceans. 
So we know there's a warm ocean un under uh, Enceladus, and we know they're hyper. So just by looking at those, uh, those uh, rings of Saturn, which Pelley didn't think we you know, yeah, understand, yeah. we may find another form of life, and, that, and we may now send missions to Enceladus to find it. I think that's fascinating. I think that's a good justification for spending the money on it. I, I don't think you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, your turn. I don't know whether you want to um, I'm, I'm aware that physicists often uh, ascribe agency to um, entities, and it's... I mean, it often turns out to be the best way to get the right answer. If you, if you um, toss a stone in the air, uh, you can say that it, you could interpret it as though the stone is trying to minimize something. I forget yeah. what it is it's trying to minimize. Or when you're um, looking at refraction, when light rays get bent through a, a glass thing and then bent and re-bent out again. Um, you can say it's as though the photons are striving to minimize their total travel time, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, we in biology do a similar thing, and it's, it's more open to misunderstanding. But um, even in physics, I think sometimes people do misunderstand. We, so we wanna, I think we're probably hardwired to look for intentionality, yes. and we talk as if there are, and we get into trouble. Our, our mutual non-friend Deepak Chopra has, um, <laughs> has uh, often mis, mis uh, described the, uh, the words of, say, Freeman Dyson, a well-known physicist, who talked about, you know, electrons decide to do this in atoms, okay? And Chopra now says, Freeman Dyson says, even atoms have consciousness, okay? It's in his way to try and fool people and make them think that quantum mechanics is related to some universal consciousness and blah, 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 blah. Um, but we do, and it, but it's, it's a very effective way of, of describing things, and probably refraction is probably the best example I know of. I, I, I tend to think of... Light behaves as if it has intentionality. It's, again, something weird and non-intuitive. Because the reason we, we see mirages, if, if, you, if any of you have been driving along the road on a hot day, you don't have to go to a desert. On a hot summer day, a long straight road, you'll see the road look wet. Okay? And, and we understand that as two, we, there's two ways to think about that. One is, well, there's lots of layers of air above the hottest air is at, at the ground and then it cools off. And at each layer of air, the light coming from the sky bends and it bends around until it comes to your eyes. So you're looking down and you see the sky. So it looks like it's water. But there's a much better way to describe it, and I, and I got this from Richard Feynman, I should say, who first learned it when he was in high school, a, the, the principle of least time, which is an am, amazing thing that Pierre de Fermat, this mathematician, first saw. It's, it's kind of amusing to me that Fermat is famous. You've all probably heard of, many of you have heard of Fermat's last theorem. How many of you have heard of Fermat's last theorem? See, look at that. What's amazing is he's known for something he didn't prove, okay? So he never proved Fermat's last theorem. He just speculated. He said he did. Yeah, he said he did, but, but that isn't good enough. But something he did show is amazing. You can, there's a totally different way of describing what the light is doing. The light is emitted from that there, and then it decides, how am I going to go to your eye? I can go in a straight line, or I can do that. Light always takes the path that takes the least time. And it turns out because light travels faster, by the, by the way, light in a medium travels slower than it does in space. So when we say light has a constant velocity, we mean an empty space. But light travels faster in less dense medium than it does in a more dense medium. So the light's up there and it says, I want to get to your eye as fast as I can. One way to get there faster is to go down and hang around wh where the air is hot and less dense as long as I can and then come back to your eye. And if you solve the mathematics, the, f the path it takes, which is due to refraction at each point, is exactly the path that light would take as if it had intentionality and, and decided to take the path that takes the lowest, least time to get to your eye. It sounds like it has intentionality. It's a nice way of talking about it, but when, of course, it doesn't have intentionality. Well, in biology, we do the same thing, and, and I think you're right that we're hardwired to look for intentionality, to look, look for agency. Yeah. Uh, and um, traditionally, in evolutionary biology, the agent had been taken to be the individual organism. And so, from Darwin's time onwards, people would ask the question, what does the lion have to do, what does the elephant have to do in order to uh, maximize its Darwinian fitness, which means its uh, reproductive success. Well, didn't you, aren't you, when you wrote The Selfish Gene, in some sense, didn't you, isn't, weren't you essentially 
in the word, the selfish gene, in some yeah. sense, of, makes people think that it's... it's that, I mean, that's right. I mean, I, I, what, all, all I did was to shift the agent from the individual organism to the gene. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you do that, you get the right answer. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you assume that the individual organism is the agent maximizing something, what's it maximizing? Well, it's not maximizing survival. I mean, it, 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 it's quite happy to die as long as it's reproduced. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not really even strictly maximizing the number of its own children or grandchildren, mm -hmm. because um, as Hamilton showed, uh, it's, it, it's, it's actually maximizing its genetic survival, which would include looking after nephews and nieces and cousins and things like that to the extent that they share genes. So you can cut through all that by simply saying, forget the individual as the agent that's doing something, concentrate on the gene. So just as a physicist says, what would a, what would a photon have to do in order to minimize the travel time? Um, what the biologist now says is, what would a gene have to do in order to maximize its propagation through future generations? And then once you do that, everything comes out right. You get the right answer. You predict that it spends a lot of its time trying to survive, but only as a means to reproduce, but not only that, but also as a means to uh, propagate genes in nephews and nieces and cousins and things. And in something like an ant or a termite, uh, something like a social insect, um, it's very complicated what it does, but you get the right answer. But, but you focus on the gene as the agent, and then some stupid philosopher comes along okay. and thinks you're, you're actually saying that genes are little kind of thinking gremlins that... <laughs> that um, well, I was going to say, do you get an, I'm glad you used the word stupid and philosopher in the same sentence, because kind of, you can get the hate mail now. But, uh, <laughs> but do, you, yeah, do you think it causes problems beyond that? I mean, you, in a sense, I mean, The Selfish Gene was a profoundly important book because it exactly did that. But did it send, for some people, the message that there is intentionality? These yes. Days? Yeah. Only, only in one or two stupid philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> no theologians? I guess they couldn't read it. It had big words. Uh, okay. No, um, I mean, well, the, 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 the theologians, I, I was approached by two different theologians who said, don't you think the selfish gene has something to do with original sin? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting. Actually, you know, but, but talking about minimizing and maximizing, let me ask you this. I was going to ask you anyway, but it comes around. Um, birds lay a certain number of eggs, and, and there must be some minimum or maximization. Okay. Um, I mean, th this, this is interesting because um, there have been people who shifted the, the agent not onto the gene or to the individual, but onto the group. Yeah. And so just as uh, we know as humans that uh, limiting population size might be a good thing to do for the sake of humanity, uh, not, to, not to overbreed, or limiting the amount of um, uh, reusing of fish, fish stocks or something of that sort. So there arose the idea that perhaps there's a kind of optimum reproductive rate for the sake of the group, for the sake of the species, mm -hmm. don't overbreed. And there was a man called Wynne Edwards who wrote a big book suggesting that a lot of what animals do in the way of defending territories and the way of dominance hierarchies and the way of flocking behavior and things was all about um, assessing the population size in order to reduce the rate of reproduction for the good of the population, for the good of the group. That's not what happens at all. What happens, and this was worked out by David Lack uh, on, on birds, on clutch size in, in birds. What happens is that each species of bird has an optimum clutch size, which might be three eggs in the, in the clutch. And the point about this is that if you lay four eggs, then you end up rearing fewer chicks. Not because of the group, but because you as an individual parent are rearing fewer chicks because you try to rear too many. And so more of them die. So more of them die. Um, so uh, if you lay too few eggs, then for more obvious reasons, you end up re rearing fewer. Mm -hmm. If you lay too many eggs, you end up rearing fewer. So for each species of bird, there is an optimum number of eggs, the optimum clutch size. And it's in that sense that animals practice birth control. It's not birth control for the good of the group. Mm -hmm. It's birth control for the good of me, and the individual a, bird. So they're practicing a minimization or maximization. You could write it as a mathematical equation. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a... You don't want to have too few, you don't want to have too many. There's got to be some point yes. where, where it's yes. optimum. But they, but and, they, they, and, and I assume natural selection finds the point that's optimum always. Well, that's what one expects. I yeah. mean, there are, there are rather odd things like 
experimentalists adding an extra egg and finding they actually can rear it perfectly well. Um, and so you have to come up with an explanation for that, but yes. Well, okay, let's see. I, well, I, I just kind of snuck that in, but I'll ask you another question before you get to me. Maybe we'll do one or two more questions apiece so we can get to some audience questions. Um, you talked about the origin of life, and I want to go back to it in some sense, with a two-part question. What's, what's the, what's, what I have realized as I've been involved in my institute, in the, uh, the Origins Project, looking at origins of life, that what is the definition of life, first of all? And then my friend Freeman Dyson, who I've talked about as a physicist, has argued that we all talk about replication as if it's the, the, the thing that defines life, but maybe it's metabolism, maybe we're in the total wrong direction. So if we think about the origin of life, what is life? What defines the difference between life and non-life? And is it replication or metabolism that's more important? There is no obligation on us to come up with a definition of life. Sure. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it could, you could regard it as a semantic question. Um, you could say, some people would say viruses are alive and other people would say viruses are not alive. I don't care. It's a bit like saying, is Pluto a planet? I mean, who cares whether Pluto is a planet? <laughs> I um, do. I do. <laughs> no, no, you don't. I do. Pluto is a planet. Don't, just don't give me, Pluto is a planet. Uh, it's the same with life. You don't, it, 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 as, as long as nothing turns on it, um, it doesn't matter what, what you call life. Now, um, I think that, what's, that if you ask the question, anywhere in the universe, what would it mean to say that life has arisen on this planet? I think for that, to answer the Freeman Dyson question, the answer to that is self-replication. That, that's what, it's self-replication is the, the single step that gets natural selection going. Once you've got self-replication, then uh, at a very, very crude chemical level, you've got the possibility of natural selection of molecules in the sea or something like that. We're nowhere near getting bodies yet. Yeah. We're just getting a differential survival of copying entities. Wherever in the universe coded information arises, coded information meaning self-replicating <coughs> entities, probably molecules, but anything that's self-replicating, um, where there, there are, there's more than one kind of replicator, such that there can be a mixed population of them, such that one of them is more successful at replicating than the other, and therefore tends to outcompete the other in the population of replicators. Once you've got that, then you've got the origin of natural selection, and then the whole crane gets going, the whole process gets but going. But as a physicist, I could say, well, you can't have that unless you can extract energy from the environment. You yeah. can't self-replicate unless you have a mechanism for taking external energy and, and, and harnessing it. So in some sense, before replication, you kind of have to have metabolism. Well, this is the, the line that Freeman Dyson is, is plugging. Um, and that may be true. It may be, I mean, all, all, all I would say about that is that uh, self-replication, which is the key process, isn't going to get started mm -hmm. unless there's a chemical precondition to make it possible, and you can call that metabolism okay. if you, if you but like. You would, but you say until you have the replication, then what really defines life, which is natural selection in a sense. Yes, it, it, it doesn't that, that, happen. That's what it, uh, natural selection only can take off when you, when you have self-replication. And to say that you need to have uh, me metabolism before, as I say, may be right, and that just means that we're talking about the, the difficulty of setting up the initial conditions under which replication can can get going. I mean, the initial conditions for DNA to get going are much more complicated than that. So we're yeah. looking for whatever the initial conditions are, for whatever the precursor of DNA was. But so, someone once said to me, I didn't get this myself, and I think we once had this conversation briefly, but I don't know if we did on stage. Um, it, by that definition, you might think of fire as life. In a sense that yes. fire, first of all, extracts energy from the environment, it self-replicates in the sense that, uh, that you start a fire here, a forest fire here, it goes there. And it almost self-replicates self in, a, in, a, in a way which is um, uh, uh, fiducial, which in a way which is uh, robust, in the sense that certain kind of trees burn hotter than other kinds of trees. Yeah, well, this is very, this is, you see, you, you, you've missed the key point. There. Okay, good. Um, uh, 
because mm -hmm. I imagine we've got a great prairie mm -hmm. and a, a forest fire starts there mm -hmm. and then a spark flies up yeah. and starts a daughter fire mm -hmm. and then another daughter over there, another daughter over there. That one then produces another and that's a granddaughter fire. Yeah. There's a, a great granddaughter, great great granddaughter. So you've got fires proliferating all over the place. Uh, that's reproduction. Mm -hmm. It's only replication if the properties of the fire come from the spark of the ancestor, come from the, come from the parent, which you know is not going to be the case. If, say, that fire is burning blue, mm -hmm. it's because there's copper in the soil. If it were the case that a blue spark flew to the next place and started another blue fire, that's heredity, that's true replication. But, let me, let me, let me but be that the doesn't devil's, happen. Well, I don't know. Let me be the devil's advocate again, okay. and say, which is a nice position for me. But uh, I would say you, there might be kind of natural selections because hotter fires will, will last more effectively. So a certain kind of tree that burns hotter Will, yes. will last longer and the daughter fires will, will, yes, will, but will, Lawrence, will survive more that, effectively. No, but you, again, the, it, you're missing the point because Good. it's it, the, the hotter fire because a certain kind of tree, yeah. it doesn't go in the spark. It has to hit another tree of the same kind. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying the ones, that, the ones that don't hit the trees of the same kind don't survive. Yeah, but, so there's, but a, there's a distribution, if you, if you wish, of fires. And the ones, that, the ones that affect, you know, I'm just trying to make you mad, but... Um. <laughs> look, look, listen to this. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> um, the, there, are, there are different, some fires burn hotter than yeah. others. Some yeah. fires burn co cooler than others. Some fires burn blue, some burn orange, some burn purple. Um, and the, the reason why they're different is the trees... Is the materials... And the, the, and the, and the soil and the, the local materials there. It doesn't go in the spark. Yeah, yeah. If it went in the spark, that would be true heredity. And, I agree. and, and that's, that's the, the key. That, it, that is exactly the point, that that's what genes do. Uh, and, and it's what fires and, and very but, little but else does. Uh, part of the reason I brought up the fire thing besides having fun was um, I think it demonstrates the problem that you said about the origin of life. Because when you get to this really nebulous thing about the original thing, the, the question of what is life, what differentiates life from non-life becomes very, it's obvious, it's like pornography. It's, you, you, don't, you, can't, you might not be able to define it, but you know it when you see it, as the judge in the United States said. And so in some sense, when things be, be, become life, it's obvious, and when they're not, yeah. it's not so. But yeah. that, there's no moment, there may, just like there's no moment of conception. That's right. Yeah. If you actually go to a hospital, yeah. see, there's no moment where you say, yeah. this is suddenly... There may be no moment, it may be a continuum uh, where you yeah. say this is alive and this yes, isn't. Yes, uh, I'm all for continuum and, and I think that um, a lot of the misery in the world is caused by people insisting on drawing lines when, the, when there aren't any. I mean, a lot of the fuss about abortion is about, is about that. Yeah. At what point does a human embryo become, become human? There is no sudden point, it's a gradual process. And similarly in evolution, at what point in evolution, um, Australopithecus, yeah. um, and I'm not even sure, I don't believe that there, I, I don't want to use the word believe. I'm skeptical that all of the different hominid species that people say are hominids are really different species. Uh, do you agree? Again, who cares? Who cares, it, exactly. It, 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 because, because the definition of a species, uh, you, you don't need a definition except for certain purposes. Yeah, and, and it's for just some a purposes way of classifying do, yes, and yeah. it's just semantics. I mean, as it point. happens, of all, the, of all the taxonomic categories, the species is the only one that, that has even a sporting chance of having an objective definition, which is the, the definition wh wh whether you can interbreed or not. Yeah, but that's changed, right? Because humans have, they say Neanderthals are different species, but, but humans and Neanderthals interbred. They and successfully say, I mean, produced that, offspring. I, exactly. And so it doesn't matter. It's not, I mean, it, it, exactly what you were saying before. At some point, um, interbreeding becomes completely impossible. It, ne it never happens. And we are definitely a different species yeah. from rhinoceroses because we can't yeah. interbreed with yeah. rhinoceroses. But eventually, uh, it's, a, if, it's, it's, and it's eventually, a continuum again. But, it's but, but you expect there to be an intermediate stage where interbreeding is possible but not very successful, not very likely. Yeah. Um, if, 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 a, if a living uh, Homo erectus were to be found, mm -hmm. um, it might be that, that you could just about produce a fertile offspring from it, probably not, but at, at some point in the, in the evolutionary chain, there would, there would be a gradual tailing off of the interbreedability mm. 
Okay. Uh, and it's, it's not going to be a sudden change. Then it's, people sort of sometimes worry about this because you say that we, are, we Homo, the genus Homo, is descended from the genus Australopithecus. Yeah. But there never was an Australopithecus couple who looked down into the cradle and said, oh, we've given birth to the first Homo. <laughs> um, it, it, do, it doesn't happen like that. Every, every child ever born was the same species as its parents. But if you stack enough of them in going back in time, um, then there, 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 there comes a point as you go, uh, once yes. you're back five, mi five million years, they're definitely different species. They, they yeah, it, it probably, didn't, it just probably looks, it, it, it's a little ugly, probably. <laughs> yes. But uh, um, your chance to, one last chance to make me mad. Do you have one more question? A question for me of anything? Um, and, then, and then I have a simple one for you, and then we'll go. Uh, well, the multiverse. Oh, yeah, that'll make me mad. Okay. Um, uh, where are all these other universes? I mean, are they, are they sort of somehow contiguous with us in... Not, I wouldn't say in space, because I know that... that but well, of course, the multiverse is a, is, a, is a word, it's a semantic word that do, isn't well-defined, maybe in some sense like life. But what, what, uh, what we've been driven to, and the, multi, the word multiverse never existed it, it, in, in science when I was a student, um, and even when I was... At, after, well, after I was a student, but we've been driven to the recognition that it's quite likely that our universe is not all there is. Now, that's required a semantic change because when I was a kid, universe meant everything. It was defined to be everything that ever could exist and ever anywhere. And so, of course, how can there be more than one of those? But operationally, partly starting with Einstein and beyond, we physicists say, well, things should have an operational meaning. Things should be defined in terms of things you can measure. If, if it can't be defined in terms of something you can measure, then it, it really doesn't mean anything, in, in physics at least. And so a, a really good operational definition of a universe is that, with, that region with which I could have ever had contact or which I could ever contact in the future. So if I say, where is the region of the, the total locus of points of space that I could ever measure? That's a universe. And then we realize that it's quite likely that, our, that, that everything we could have ever measured or we could ever measure in the future might not be unique. There could be other regions which we could never potentially have any causal okay, contact Okay, can I just with. stop you there? Um, we, the, the, that part of the, that, that universe which we can have contact mm. with is a sphere with us at the center. Isn't no. It? Why, why not? No, no, it's not, it's not a sphere with us at the center. We're not the center. But we, well, we are in the sense that, that everywhere we look, we can only see uh, 13 billion oh, light years. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's the measure, exactly. But, but as, you, as you know, if you, if actually, your universe has you at the center right there. Yes. And the universe that I can see from here is, has me at the center. Yes. And, 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 but that's just a property of where we are. It's not a property of the universe. Yeah, I thought but, that's what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, but, but that's right. But, so we realize that, that we're limited in what we can see now. Yeah. That's fear. But, but our universe is more than that. We say the universe is that which, even if we wait an infinite amount of time, is there a finite region of space that we might be able to contact? Or even if there's an infinite region of space that we could, event, if we waited an infinite amount of time, in many universes, you'd think that you could see an infinite distance. And in some universes, that's true. But even then, we realize that that may not be all there is. You could have an infinity of infinities. Infinity is a weird thing, and, it, and when you start thinking about it, it's highly non-intuitive. And I could give examples, but I think it's a little late in the night evening to talk about that. But we, we've come to realize that, more importantly, that all of our basic ideas of, of elementary particle physics all suggest that there should be other universes, other either distinct spaces that will be, are, are forever, will forever be unaffected by us, that, are, are, that have maybe even different laws of physics, okay, that that's, arises naturally from our fundamental principles. But there are other weirder universes, which also are kind of multiverses, in, in, this, in this idea called string theory, which is misnamed. And I often say string theory does a disservice to evolution because the deniers would always say, well, evolution is just a theory. And they use the colloquial term for theory, 
Whereas in science, theory is the most robust thing you can ever get. Quantum theory, Newton's theory of gravity, these are things that, a theory is something that's been tested over and over and over, and evolution is, has been one of the most well-tested theories, which is why we raise it to the level of theory. String theory should be called the string hypothesis, at best. <laughs> at best. String nonsense at worst. But, <laughs> but there are, it's not really nonsense because it's well-motivated. Many ideas from physics suggest that in order to unify um, gravity and quantum mechanics, there is, an, there is a mathematical model that might allow that. And that model, however, requires there to be more dimensions than we live in. And then you say, where are those extra dimensions? Well, there's two possibilities. One is the original idea was they were very, very small, so you can't see them. But a more radical idea that, that actually one of my students was involved in proposing is that there are actually extra infinite dimensions above your nose right now in an extra dimension. There could be a whole infinitely big universe. You can't picture it, but it, that's okay. It's just like Flatland, when the, you read the book Flatland, where you know, an ant living on a surface may not ever be able to picture that third dimension, but it's there. And so you can imagine an infinite number of, of pieces of paper, if you wish, okay, for the ant, the, that piece of paper is its universe, but in a, in a little bit in that third dimension, there could be another piece of paper that's infinitely big, and another one, and it may be that there are an infinite number, or maybe a finite number, of extremely large universes, and we don't see them because our particles, the particles that make us up, are forced to exist on only that, that three-dimensional universe we live in, and in fact, it may be just gravity that could permeate between them, and that would make it unobservable, and it would mean that there could be lots of different universe. If, if our universe is ten-dimensional, as many of those ideas suggest, there's lots of room for extra dimensions. So there's either, there's either multiverses which are infinitely far away in space, or that have different laws of physics, or multiverses that are really, literally, a, a hair's breadth away in an extra dimension. They're both reasonably well-motivated. The one that suggests different universes in space is very well-motivated. But all this may sound like counting angels on the head of a pin. It may just sound like, why are you, why are you proposing these things? Because you'll never measure them. And if you can't measure them, then are they science? Or are they philosophy or theology? And what's exciting for me is that we are on the cusp of maybe indirectly knowing that they exist. The same way that 100 years ago, people never thought you'd see atoms. Okay, in fact, the first person to really argue that atoms existed was really Einstein, because in, in his PhD thesis, where he showed that the, something called Brownian motion allowed you to show that essentially atoms exist, even though no one ever thought you'd be able to ever see an atom. And the chemists by 1910 or 15, atoms were the center of chemistry. Everyone accepted the existence of atoms, even though people thought you'd never, ever be able to see one. It turns out we can now, but at, but at the time they were willing to accept it because all of the predictions of atomic physics explained everything we can see. It turns out that there are ideas that we may be able to test at the edge of cosmology, these existence of things called gravitational waves from the beginning of time, which if we could measure them, would tell us that other universes must exist. Even though that we can't measure those universes, the fact that those gravitational waves were generated at the beginning of time is a signature of the fact that other universes must exist, that we could never see. And if there are other universes with different laws and constants, then that would be a way of explaining why our own laws and constants seem to be fine-tuned. Exactly, but, it, but, that's, but what I want to point out is that that's not the reason. That's that not the reason, no. It, 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 that's really important because you know that I, when I get... You know, theologians, when I give this presentation about that, I've often been attacked for saying, well, you've, you've just invented that because you don't like God. And it's true. But, I mean, it's true I don't like God, but not, that's not the reason we, we, we didn't propose them for that. We opposed them for, proposed them for a good reason, which is to explain fundamental properties of matter. And that's a consequence, and many of us find it very distasteful. Because we, I grew up at a time when we all, when the, whole, the same reason that Einstein became a physicist, I want to understand why the universe had to be the way it is. I wanted to be, in some sense, the first person to know why the universe had to be the way it is. And now we find out that maybe 
that's a bad question. That the universe doesn't have to be the way it is. It could have been some other way. And there's no rules, maybe, and it's just an accident. And the universe is the way it is because we're here to measure it. And if it was different, we wouldn't be able to ask the same question. It's very unsatisfying, but we may have been driven there. Let me, let me close with a quick answer question and then we'll get to you because I, got, I talked about science fiction last night in a way. And I wanted to ask you, you know, and it's one of the themes of this, of this uh, festival is sort of science fact and science fiction. Do you think science fiction serves a useful purpose? I think good science fiction does. I, I, um, I've, I've actually, I'm afraid to say I've never seen Star Trek. I apologize for that. <laughs> well, you saw a little bit of it last night because you're in the audience. Yes, I saw clips. a bit of that. Okay. Um, I mean, I would answer that with respect to, I, mean, I think the, the answer is yes. Um, two of my favorite science fiction novels are Fred Hoyle, The Black Cloud, and uh, Daniel Galloy, um, Dark Universe. Yeah, The Black um, Cloud was great. The Black Cloud, uh, yes, I mean, I think I learned a lot of science from The Black Cloud. I think I learned to understand information theory from The Black Cloud. I think I learned to understand that the, what, what in, in that book Fred Hoyle calls the deep problems, that may be so far beyond human understanding that if a human mind, even the mind of a brilliant physicist, attempts to understand them, he just fries his brain and dies. Um, uh, the idea that um, uh, the same discovery may be made in two quite different ways at roughly the same time, that, that's in there. Uh, so there are a whole lot of scientific lessons in there. The other book, Daniel Galloy, is about a world, a dark, dark universe. It's about a world in which um, people are, are in total darkness and they evolve echolocation like bats. Yeah. Um, and nobody quite knows why they're in total darkness. They're evidently underground. And uh, what's fascinating is that they have a mythology which is about light. So they, they don't know what light is. They've never seen light. They live in total and complete darkness but they worship light, they have a religion of light. Their language is suffused with references to light. They say, great light almighty, and light knows, and, 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 <laughs> and, um, and oh for light's sake. And, uh, and um, finally you learn, if you haven't already guessed, that the, 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 the truth of the matter is that they're survivors of a nuclear holocaust who were sent underground um, and for some reason, the, the, the electricity failed. Mm -hmm. And so they've, they've adapted, they've, they've evolved to cope with darkness in biological ways, but also in mythological ways as well. So I think both those books seem to me to be um, mind-enhancing. Exactly, mind-enhancing. Yeah. I think that's, and to me, that's what science and science fiction do share, is the idea that they both try and take us out of our myopic view that somehow what we think is normal is always normal. Science fiction expands it in some ways. <coughs> science expands it in some ways. The difference is, as Feynman said, that science, unlike science fiction, science is science fiction or imagination in a straitjacket. Because it's easy to imagine any universe. It's hard to imagine the actual universe. It's a little harder. But good science fiction has a sort of partial straitjacket. It's not, I mean, bad science fiction just lets anything go. Yeah. Uh, and that it actually be and becomes supernatural. Yeah. And, and, and we don't want that. What we, what, what we want is a, is a disciplined departure from the straitjacket. Okay, well, I think with a disciplined departure, I think we've, we've talked for a little over an hour, and, um, and I want to give about 20 or 25 minutes of questions at least for you. We started late, so I know some of you, um, we were going to start at 7.30, but we started about 8. So uh, let me open it up to questions from you, and thank you for, for your patience, first of all, and thank you, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's okay. I wasn't. Let, let me um, explain how we're going to do this. Um, thank you. Um, so we have a translator, so you can ask questions in any language, and I um, and he'll he'll translate from any language, and and um, and then I will repeat the question, so that the other translator who goes translates from English to Czech will be able to. Translate, so which I didn't do last night, so we'll, we'll try that. Okay, um, but everyone has to have a microphone, right? We'll start simple, okay. Someone should get you a microphone. Or do we have microphones? Maybe we don't. I can say it loud and you can repeat. Okay, I'll repeat, okay. My question is, 
question is, uh, both of you are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is, both of you are uh, very well-known public atheists, and presumably you believe the world would be better if more people were atheists. And yet, sometimes your public comments are criticized, even by atheists, as being perhaps too strident, and rather than convincing others to join the fold, actually turns them away. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, do you contemplate that in your public statements? Do you contemplate whether your approach is, you know, even acknowledging the psychology of people, um, the best way to go about creating the change that you want to see? Or are your public comments simply reflections of your personal feelings and you're just sort of saying it as it is? You can't be bothered to, you know, <laughs> try, to try to be more strategic with those communications. It, okay, do it doesn't follow that because one is an atheist, one thinks the world would be a better place. That's right. That's why if, I said, that's if, why I said uh, presumably. Yes. So presumably, um, I mean, I, I think it would be a better place, but it doesn't, that doesn't actually follow. Um, I care about the truth more than I care about uh, what people think about it. Um, so I would never compromise on the truth in order to be more persuasive, I think. Um, I don't regard myself... Um, I, I, I don't necessarily accept the adjective strident, which I've heard over and over and over again. Uh, you hear it so many times, people actually start believing it. Um, I, I think that the word strident and shrill and, all, and similar words come about because we have all become accustomed to the convention that you don't criticize religion. As Douglas Adams said, you don't criticize religion. Why don't you? Because you just don't. <laughs> but no reason has ever been given. Uh, there is no reason why you, religion should be immune to criticism any more than politics. Nobody says, oh, you, don't, you mustn't criticize somebody's politics because it offends them or it upsets them. Um, if somebody holds a view about the, the universe, about life, about morality, which can be called religious, if they've got their view from their parents, from a tradition, from a, from a holy book, then they should be prepared to argue for it and not shelter behind a smoke screen of saying, oh, that's my religion, you're not allowed to argue with me if you do your strident. Let me jump in because um, you probably know, because I'm sure we've talked about it in public, that we first got to know each other because we had disagreements about, in some sense, that question. And I used to think Richard was strident. And um, then, you know, I <laughs> suddenly realized that he isn't in a in way, I, I'd bought in, I'd bought the, drunk the lemonade, or Kool-Aid, um, because I started to be attract, attacked as being strident when I just simply asked questions. For asking, the, for asking the simple question, could you create a universe without God? Let me, is that possible? I suddenly found myself getting the same adjectives applied to me. When, and and I'm sometimes, of course, I want to provoke, and I'm sure Richard does too, but that's part of being a teacher, first of all to provoke. I think to get people to think about their, the, the, get, break out of their own misconceptions is to, sometimes you have to provoke people, I think. But, but I think people get, we get called strident when we're not. And, and I've listened to, and when, been with Richard a lot, and, and um, he just says, first of all, he says what he thinks, and he's a very gentle, generous person to l listen to other people's ideas. He, you know, if he, if he finds them ridiculous, he'll say them ridic that's ridiculous. But is that strident? That, that's not inappropriate, I think. And in fact, uh, it gives me a chance to bring up something very topical. I was just talking to Richard about it today. I was just reading the New York Times and I just tweeted about it. That uh, Stéphane Charbonneau, Charbonnier? Charbonneau, the former editor of, um, of, uh, of, um, Charlie Hebdo. of Charlie Hebdo, who got killed. Two days before he got killed, he finished a book. And the book was a beautiful book, which I, couldn't, I haven't read the book yet, but I've been reading quotes from it, saying that Islam should not, there's no reason it shouldn't be ridiculed. In fact, it does a disservice to Islam to say it shouldn't be ridiculed. It ultimately leads to racism, he argued, and, and, and I'll let you read why he thought of that. Because to say, if, to say Islam 
is not, can't be ridiculed to say, is, is to say the same thing as that Islam can't be um, compatible with democracy. Maybe it can't, but to make that claim is to, over, is to, is to demean Islam here. So it's interesting because he basically argued that the very effect of ridiculing Islam was, was to, in some sense, a good thing for Islam. And so I think it's re vitally important uh, to echo what Richard said, that to, to use ridicule as, as, a, as a tool, and it's an important tool that we use for every other area of activity, but when we say someone's r political ideas are ridiculous, we're not called strident, necessarily. But we are, the minute we, the, mi the, minute we ask the question, because you're not supposed to bring it up in polite conversation, and who the hell said that? Who the hell, you know, in fact, I think I learned from you Stephen Fry's argument, we, we offend people. Well, the offense, when you're offended, you own the offense. You have a decision on how to respond. You can decide to cut someone's head off, or you can say, let me explain to you why I'm right. But you have, you own the problem, not the offender. And as Stephen Fry, which I learned from you, once said, you know, oh, I hear I've offended you. What did he say? Uh, you can use the words. Well, it, what did he say? Um, oh, well, you're, you're offended. Well, so fucking what, was what he said. I yes. wanted you to say it, not me. <laughs> okay. But, but um, uh, uh, Christo Christ Christopher Hitchens had a slightly more restrained version of that. Um, you're offended. I'm still waiting to hear your argument. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so that's the, that's the point. Anyway, we've, a lot, we've gone on too long. But okay, let's go. Oh, do we? 20 minutes left, I'm told. Okay, that's not bad. Um, that's time for one question. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Let's take the young lady over there. You, yes, you, 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 don't look behind you. You, you, you. So stand up so they can get you a microphone. There she, there you go. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, why do you think the uh, Hameroff and Penrose theory of consciousness is wrong? Why do I think what? Um, why it is wrong. Why what's wrong? The, con the uh, theory of consciousness of Hameroff and Penrose. Oh, and oh my why, goodness. And um, <laughs> why okay. have they been studying for so long? Yeah, well, it's nonsense. That's why it's wrong. But um, <laughs> it's, um, look, it, 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 first of all, the question was, what, why do I think this theory of Hameroff and, and, and Penrose, which is really, again, a misuse of the word theory, is, is wrong? And the, and the um, as, as Pauli would have said, I don't think it's, it's even good enough to be wrong. Um, it, it makes claims based on assumptions about the way the, way the brain works in, in quantum mechanically that have no experimental validation whatsoever, or at this point, any fundamental theoretical value, uh, uh, validation based on our ideas of physics. It makes claims that are unsubstantiated. Now, Therefore it, it, therefore, it isn't yet wrong. It's just not even worth talking about. Until you have some way of validating, and, it make, and they're very... I have this mantra that I learned from the publisher of the New York Times, which is that I like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. <laughs> okay? And so that's what I use when I read any article in a scientific journal. And this is no different. I, there are lots of articles in scientific journal. I look at that and I say, you know, <laughs> or something else. But I just look and I say, it's not worth even thinking about at this point. Let them, give me some evidence, give me some reason, give me some good arguments, and I'll worth thinking about it. So at this point, I dismiss it as something that's not worth talking about yet. And if they can demonstrate to me that it's worth talking about, I'll listen. That's all. I mean, I just have a certain amount of time, and, and people often ask me, why don't you investigate this UFO experience in 1947. And, and, as, and as Richard Feynman said, you know, I think UFOs are more likely due to the known irrationality of humans than the unknown rationality of aliens. And, and so, you, as a scientist, you judge which questions are worth following, which questions are worth asking, which questions are worth thinking about. And you have to ask what's likely and unlikely. Sometimes you're wrong, but that's a guide. And this one, I don't think satisfies any of those reasons, so I don't want to think about it. And I certainly, and Stuart Hameroff always wants to get on stage with me, just like theologians, some, some fundamentalists do, because it, it, 
being on stage with him would suggest I take him seriously. Just like being on stage with people I've been on stage with sometimes suggests I take them seriously, and I hate to do that. Okay. Um, let's see. More questions. Um, do you want to pick one? Well, that, 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 okay. That. Yeah. You want to? You, yes, your front row. Okay, wait till the. Uh, tomorrow, Richard is going to talk about Aaron races about, say, evolutionary battle between rabbits and foxes, cuckoos and hoes, and so on. Uh, it's quite tempting to see the similar arms race in human society and culture, say, arms race between ideas on science versus religion, ideas on critical thinking versus ideas on uh, non-thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, uh, my impression is that in these debates, for they've been running on for decades, uh, this religious side didn't change at all. It's kind of foss fossilized. It's non-evolving. So did your arguments evolve in response to these non-evolving counter-arguments? Okay, did everyone hear that, or should we repeat that? Okay, the, the question is, initially, Richard is, is going to talk tomorrow about an evolutionary arms races, and the, the, the questioner sees uh, arms races in, in the, not the traditional arms race, but the arms race of ideas, and, and in some cases between critical thinking and, 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 and faith, and the impression he has is in those debates have been going on for decades, but the religious side has never changed its views. It's fossilized, it's always the same. Um, and have we changed our, our, our arguments in response? So I don't the, know. The, the I essence of an arms race is, is and whether it's evolutionary or, or a human arms race, is that as each side escalates, it forces the other side to escalate. So they escalate together. Uh, and rabbits and foxes on the one hand, I'll talk about that tomorrow, and um, missiles and counter-missiles and anti-missile missiles and, and fighter planes and jet planes and things do. Now, in an argument like uh, religion, um, I'm not sure it's true to say that they don't change. Yeah, I, 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 I think it, in a way, one of the irritating things is that they constantly change, yeah. constantly shift the goalposts um, so that um, Whereas you can argue against biblical theology, you can argue against um, Noah's Ark, and you can argue against Adam and Eve and things, that, that, that's what a lot of Americans believe in. And then sophisticated theologians come along and say, oh, we don't believe in that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we believe in, 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 that it's all metaphorical. And so you find that, you're, that it's like arguing with a wet sponge. You, don't, you, you, you constantly find that the thing you're, you're arguing with is changing. And they always say that whatever you're interpreting them as, you don't understand it. It's really yeah, not what we're yes, saying. Yes, that's right. Now, um, I suppose that, I mean, are, are, are there good arguments that escalate in an arms race-like way? Um, not necessarily religion, but, uh, but do scientific arguments. I mean, I suppose you could say um, you change your argument. You, 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 you listen to what the other person says. And then you say, oh yeah, that's a good point, but on the other hand, what about this? Um, that, would, that might be a good analogy for an arms race. But, you know, the, but let me give an example, a real good example of how they change. They're, they're, they're the honest people, or the ones who are trying to be honest, who are the theologians who think they know what they're talking about, but, and, they, and they say, you don't really understand, but you know, we sort of do. But, there, but in this debate, it's political, it's a power thing. And there are people who really want to teach intelligent design in schools instead of science. And they really do change their arguments constantly. And that politically, we, all, we keep thinking we've won, and then they always change the goalposts. And in the United States, in many cases, we beat back intelligent design in the courts, showing that it isn't science. So the courts ruled that intelligent design is no different than creationism, which isn't science. So then they say, well, you know what, we, we don't want to teach it. We want to teach critical thinking. And what, we what that really means is we really want to teach all views. Let's, let's teach kids everything and let them decide. And, 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 you know, and that works. And then that doesn't work. And they say, well, we don't want to do, to do it in things that are, because the courts say, well, that's still religion in a way. But they say, well, we want to do the same thing with climate change. Let's, let's put evolution and climate change together. They're both controversial. And they create these illusions. And it's a constant political battle. So they're always evolving and we have to always 
uh, unfortunately evolve counter arguments. So it really is a, a, a there was a beautiful example of that when when um, uh, they lost on creationism, yeah. and so they changed its name to intelligent design. And um, there was a there was a, a, te a textbook yeah. uh, in which they did they or they just simply got their word processor their Microsoft Word and did a global search and replace, changing the word creation to intelligent design. But they made a mistake at one point, and so it came out as I forget what it was it was something like cre intelligent. Cre <laughs> um, it, it, I forget exactly what it what it was. But, but it came but, up it came up in the court case in Dover that eventually, yes. that because they, they were trying to argue that it was different than creationism and, and what, the, what, the, uh, what the scientists who were depending at the time showed that this very book that they wanted to use in the schools had taken the word creationism. Yeah. When the courts decided creationism, the year after the courts decided creationism wasn't science, they just did a global search and replace. And they were, they that, called, that and really was the smoking gun. Right? That was that killed it. That won that case for us. It really did. There was a lovely story of a, of a, of a I heard from a literary agent. A, 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 a woman wrote a novel, whose um, whose hero was called David, and the novel was all ready to go and it was all practically set up in type, and then she suddenly decided that um, actually her hero wasn't a David after all. He was more like a Kevin, so she did a global search and replace, changing David to. Kevin, and that was fine, except that they went to a certain art gallery in Florence. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, next question. We want to get a few more in. How, you tell, you're keeping the time, apparently. Are you? Oh, you just told, okay, good. I'll, I'll, I got it. We probably have time for about three or four more questions, um, if they're good ones. Okay. Uh, let, why don't we take, I'll get to you. but. I may give you the last question. How about I give you the last one, okay? Okay, you, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, earlier on, you were talking about uh, Einstein getting his idea about uh, the general relativity from uh, thinking about riding an elevator. Yeah. So they got me thinking, uh, had the elevators not been invented yet at that time, he might have never come up with that idea, probably. Well, Maybe, you know... It, but, so <laughs> could you probably, both of you, comment on the importance of... Uh, of a chance or you know the seemingly unimportant things like backs of the envelopes or elevators or anything like that to your respective fields or the science that in the general well, well one thing you're, it's a really good point and it's, and it's really important to realize that science is a product of its time that's people don't realize that scientists are social beings and therefore the science is done now it's very different Saying scientists are social beings is di very different than saying science is a social construct, okay? Two different things. The scientists are human, but the science works independently of whether it's done by white men or, 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 or whatever. Uh, in the whatever can be whatever. But anyway, um, and so, but I, I do think it's really important to realize that, that we are motivated in, in thinking about the universe by things that prompt us and things that are familiar often and so there are many things that we as a physicist I don't know and it's probably true as a biologist if, if we didn't have the technology to do um, uh, or the computer power to do say genomics then the direction of biology right now would be very different and and so we are products of what of the tools that we have and so we use the tools we have and that drives the science forward but those tools change sometimes the tools are thought experiments and sometimes they're experimental, but we're, we can only ask the questions that we can ask. And in that sense, the science that's done now couldn't have been done by the Greeks because even if they, you know, even, even if they're brilliant in ways that we can't imagine, because they just didn't have the physical tools. I don't know if you want We moved on from, uh, in, in early centuries, um, clocks were, uh, were the sort of favorite model, a nice clock with the cog wheels going around and things, and that served as a model for um, living things and also for the physical world, I think, yeah. and then computers nowadays. I sometimes think if we had evolved in, uh, in a weightless environment like on the space station, mm -hmm. where um, the difference between weight and mass is uh, immediately apparent and when you jump in the air you go on indefinitely until you hit the ceiling, mm -hmm. um, New Newton's laws would have come about centuries earlier if we if Galileo we were not, would have been... If, wouldn't yeah, if we, if we were not stuck the bottom of a gravity well, as, as um, Douglas Adams said. Um, we are, I mean, gravity tra traps us and traps our mind um, 
and I, I repeat again that that's what science is, is an effort to overcome our myopia. An effort to overcome, to either think of things or do things that's, that make us see our experience from outside in a different way. Which is also why I think science is like, and it's, this festival is a wonderful example of it in my opinion, why science is like art and music and literature is because they all do the same thing. At their best, all of those things force us to re-examine our, ourselves from a different perspective and therefore en enhance the experience of being human. And that's why I think the value, ultimately the value of science really is, it's not, in my opinion, the technology as much as the, as the cultural benefit of, of enhancing the experience of being human. I don't know, should we go to one? Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, is there anyone in the very back? Yeah? W last question? Okay, good, last question. It seems so interesting. No, anyway, um, last question. So who's got the best, oh yeah, I, get, I promised you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I promised this young gentleman, and he's going to need to be translated. I am proud of you. You said that you were talking about the world, if you were talking about something else. I am proud of you, first of all, that I have one in the world, and around me there are others, like bubbles, so I think. Avšak, já se, jestli by se dali kvalifikovat, se ptám, jestli by se dali kvalifikovat jako další vesmíry i paralelní vesmíry, ve kterých vlastně, ve kterých mám všechny možnosti času. Takže může být například nějaký paralelní vesmír, ve kterém já jsem úspěšný multimiliardář. Nebo je... It's good, whatever it is, it must be a good question. Let, okay, let me... Okay. okay. So I asked when, when you uh, have spoken about the, the one universe, but also about the multiverse. And there's the one, and the others uh, are just around it like bubbles. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask first if they qualify uh, as real universes, uh, or, the, or just the parallel universes, uh -huh. and if the parallel universes exist, <laughs> <laughs> if in, in within the all possibilities of the time, if there is some universe where I am a very successful millionaire. Ah, okay. <laughs> It was a very good question. Okay, I will, yes. Okay, it's a long one, but I've talked about, about many universes and I've talked about one universe and then, and then uh, universes maybe surrounding it, which you might think of as parallel universes. And the, there were two parts to this question. Are those parallel universes really other universes or not? And if there are maybe an infinite or large number of universes, is there one in which he is a successful millionaire? Okay, and the answer is yes. <laughs> it's a simple one. Um, in fact, it, it's it's. Let me let me leave you dizzy, <laughs> dizzier, because if there really are an infinite number of universes, infinity is very strange. It's it's it, as Woody Allen said. Um, Infinity is a, is a really long time, especially near the end. Um, <laughs> it means that not only is there a universe in which essentially a, a, a complete replica of you exists, but is a successful millionaire, there's a universe, there are an infinite number of those universes. And there's also an infinite number of universes in which I'm sitting down there asking you the question up here, which you also might like. And there are an infinite number of universes in which this exact conversation happened. But there are also an infinite number of universes in which the conversation happened and one word changed. Everything happens an infinite number of times. And if that's really true, then it confronts many ideas about what we think about why our universe is the way it is. In fact, it's a problem that's forcing physicists to confront this question. If you have an infinite number of universes, and things are probabilistic, how can you determine probabilities if you have infinities? And we don't know the answer. And as I said to you last night about Star Trek, I hope you come up with the answer. You're 11 years old now, right? You got a lot of time. Think about it. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Thank you.
Thank you so much. 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 Th